Hey everyone, welcome to the Tension Podcast, where we acknowledge that most of life and faith is lived in the tension between the two extremes. On this show, we're going to look at what many of us were taught growing up in evangelical churches, weigh it against what our current culture is saying, and try to find out what Jesus has for us in the tension between the two. If we haven't met, my name is Jonathan Caron, and we're joined, as always, by our co-host, Mr. Eric Williams. Eric, go ahead and say hey to the people. This, I mean, this is like, other than politics, this is probably the topic I look forward to every season and try to sprinkle in as much of this as possible. So I'm excited. We're hopping on the horse. Giddy up, baby. We may have changed our name, Uh huh. but at our core, Ooh. we cannot escape purity culture. Cannot escape it. We can survive it. We can overcome it. <laughs> we cannot escape it. We have to do it. And if you're listening to this as it comes out, hey, welcome to summer. That's it right. is officially summertime. Well, unofficially summertime i guess would be. ignore it's the fact that if you're Who if cares? you're if you're watching us on youtube ignore the fact that i'm wearing a hoodie because we're not recording this in summer but but if you're listening enjoy that sip of whatever adult beverage or caffeinated beverage you have by the pool as you're listening unless it's like i don't know about you live in the southwest so it's hot in like february there but here in the southeast i mean north of like South Georgia, all the way to like mid Atlantic, we get warm in February. It gets cold again in March. We'll get some warm in April, but then Memorial day is hit or miss. It can either be in the fifties or it can be in the eighties. So I'm hoping that as I listen to this, when it comes out, it's in the eighties, but there's a good chance it's 52 degrees and raining today. No, right now I can guarantee when we're listening to this, it's going to be high 70s, 80s, sunny. That's the thing about being out here in the Southwest. Other Southwest uh, people can can tell me, let me know. But like if you live in in the desert areas in New Mexico or like Phoenix, like I just spent some time in Phoenix, you definitely you're wearing uh, you're wearing sh- shorts or pants and a t shirt, but you're bringing a light jacket because if you step into the shade, it's actually like the true temperature of whatever 59 60 degrees and it's chilly but as soon as you get out in the sun man you are baking and you are wishing that you were just like ripping off all of the extra clothing so so yeah speaking of ripping off all of the extra clothing speaking let's get into that, uh, I, if you didn't go with it i was gonna go with it it was too good not to use it as a transition uh, i should have thought today, ahead and wore my tank top today <laughs> i should have been showing off the shoulders and the guns sun's out what whatever's out guns out buns out buns out yeah Oh <laughs> We're not showing that on here though. But today and this week, we are revisiting a topic we've covered a few different times on the show, but we want to unpack it in this new tension format. So today we're talking about the tension between bouncing your eyes and transforming our mind. If you grew up in the church around purity culture, you've heard the phrase bounce your eyes, especially if you're a guy. But today we want to look at what if there's a better option? Or what if there is another option? What if there's a tension between bouncing your eyes and something else? So like we do each week, we're going to dive into each side of this discussion. And then we'll try to figure out at the end, like how do we live in the tension between these two things? So on the first side, we've got the idea of bouncing your eyes. And you may or may not know where this comes from, but it comes from the book, Every Man's Battle, which is something that evangelical boys were given like a bar mitzvah gift. (laughs) Uh, as they were hitting puberty (laughs) it's like you you had to read every man's battle as soon as your parents as soon as your parents saw your browsing history and saw a couple of things on there like (laughs) when they realized that you were going to dicks.com instead of dicksportinggoods.com they were like hey son time for you to read this actually i guess if you're going to dicks.com you probably need another book but anyway (laughs) besides the point when you're searching out things like boobies on uh, on your search history, that's when mom and dad said, it's time to have the talk. What talk? Not about puberty, not about your changing, but about how you need to bounce your eyes. The general idea was <laughs> that if you look at a woman too long, you're mm-hmm. going to lust after her. Ooh, any one of them. So instead of looking at women like normal human beings, you were taught to bounce your eyes, to look from her <laughs> to other things and that in and of itself would keep you from lusting after her by simply bouncing your eyes and this like maybe we should break out the crazy stories from liberty sounder here but every (laughs) stories from liberty 
every spring on that first warm day, and I, I think this happens at every college, but it, it was this is a uniquely Liberty experience because every spring there'd be a baseball game on a Tuesday afternoon, that first Uh-oh. day that it was like 70, 75 degrees or something like that. And at some schools, I would guess your secular schools, the girls are showing up in shorter shorts and tank tops and all that. Mm. Yep. At Liberty, our girls showed up in sundresses. Okay. And it became Bouncerized Tuesday. Ooh. Because it was the first time we'd seen shoulders in a while. Oh, boy. It's the first time we had seen above the knee in a while. Ooh, baby. And the upper part of a girl's chest around her neck. Ah. It's the first, like, and clavicle. So that was, oh, yeah. They're, 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 they're so tempting. But I remember he, overhearing conversations in the stands at baseball games of guys saying to make sure you bounce your eyes oh today my gosh. because of what the girls were wearing. Oh man. Okay. Okay. So that put, that gives like a whole new meaning. I just think this, this is, this is probably very niche to like uh, this conversation, but those who are in like the fitness community, I think we got like the spaghetti strap thing going on uh, and your, you know, your shoulder area and this muscle back here, you know, the trapezius muscle. We just automatically call that, say, this is the definition of thirst traps. That's the Liberty thirst trap. Because as soon as that shoulder comes out, baby, woo, we are bouncing our eyes. The upper I'll, arm. I'll tell you this. Shoulder. Now, I did not grow up in church. I mean, longtime listeners know that. I, I started going to church. I went to a Catholic church for four weeks when my grandmother was watching me while my parents were out of the country for a month adopting my sister. And that was traumatic. I didn't go back to church until junior high. And then we started going to church. Uh, and then I didn't go to church in high school at all. And I made fun of all the church kids. So what, I never really heard this term bounce your eyes until I was like late high school into college. And so when I had these like Christian church kids saying, okay, you know, man, when, when a woman walks by, bro, you got to bounce your eyes, dude. And I'm thinking, hell yeah, I got to bounce my eyes. You got to go from the top <laughs> to the bottom to the back. I mean, I'm bouncing my eyes all over the place. Like, that's right. You take in that tall drink of water, you know, <laughs> bounce those eyes up. And, and I thought they meant like, like they were talking about like, okay, when they're walking and things are bouncing, you got to like bounce your eyes with it. So I was like, I did not get this as a, bounce your eyes off of the thing that you're looking at in order to avoid lusting and temptation. So take that one. That's uh, I don't know. Oh, we no, that's we a great story. Pro- probably need a new segment called Eric didn't grow up in church. He was a heathen. Probably still is. Boom, boom. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, we laugh at bounce your eyes, but it's not terrible advice. On one hand, it's a good base level advice because if you look at something you're attracted to for too long, it's going to naturally consume your mind. And even if we take this away from sexuality, when you look at that thing, whatever that thing is, that whatever your hobby is, and you keep coming back to it, you begin to desire it. Like, Eric, you've talked on here about your Amazon cart, you keep coming back to it over and over and you start desiring things. And that is a natural feeling. So the idea of, Hey, don't look at this thing for too long because you're going to want it in ways that are unhealthy or unbiblical, whatever the un is at, at its base level, that's not terrible advice. Right. I mean, it, it is natural. And in fact, the difference is it's playing on your, uh, like, if you think about your brain chemistry, it's playing on your emotion centers of your brain, as opposed to the rational centers of our brain. So, you know, I know for most of you fundamentals, fundamentalists, like you're going to tune it out here. But like, if you think from an evolutionary perspective, Jonathan's going to beep that out for all of you that, you know, throw that away. Uh, our emotional centers of our brains, or, you know, kind of that reptile brain, um, that that's the thing that reacts first. And then it takes a little while, like evolutionary speaking, I know trigger warning, sorry guys. The the rational side of our brains is kind of the least developed over time. And so when you see those Facebook ads over and over again, or like you know, when my Amazon cart, my wish list comes up or whatever, 
like it's just going to play on those emotion centers that when you're in a spot where it's like, I need retail therapy, I need to hit a serotonin, I need to know that I have a tracking number to see a shipment coming to my house, you know, hitting that, hitting that buy now button is so cathartic for some people that it's like, but you've been, you've been played into that by the messages over and over and over that are consuming you. So that's where this is the same thing where it's like, if you are continuing to look at uh, the members of the opposite sex as just physical pieces, that emotional base, then yes, of course, that will impact the way that you are going to make a rash and emotional decision that is not based in your rational thinking or thought. And you hit on what is what I believe is the downside of bouncer eyes is the idea of you're looking at that other person as a sexual object. Right. Because the problem with bouncer eyes is that it treats the opposite sex. Usually women, this is taught usually to boys, every man's battle. That's where it came from. Yeah. But girls watch out when it's gray sweatpants season, you better be bouncing those (laughs) eyes. My eyes are up here, ladies. Okay. My eyes are up here. When I'm wearing my Henley, when I'm showing off my forearm, you know, muscles, eyes are up here. Okay. Not a piece of meat. (laughs) Uh, What is backwards hat season? Uh Uh-huh. I see you lusting. (laughs) I see you lusting after that square in my forehead showing through my hat. Mustaches. Mustaches, maybe. I don't know. I don't know what does it for you. I'm not going to kink shame, but still bounce those eyes. The problem with bounce your eyes. If I'm holding a puppy or a baby, <laughs> ladies, taken. See this? My ring is on my finger right here. Don't look at me as a sexual object. I'm done. I'm the done. problem. <laughs> <laughs> The problem with the idea of bouncer eyes, though, is that it 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 centers the opposite sex as someone who is inherently a sexual being, and they are a danger to you and your thoughts. That is first and foremost what and who they are, and it puts all of the responsibility of sin on the other person. They're going to make you stumble. So you need to bounce your eyes. That person is good looking. They're wearing gray sweatpants. She is showing her clavicle. So by nature, you're going to sin if you look at them for too long. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's the problem is that, you know, like in our old format, we would talk about like, what was the good behind it and things like that. And, and like, there is this sense of, I need to protect myself from my own desires So I need to watch out for my eyes. I I wish like, you know, if I had a vote on this one, which I didn't just spoiler alert, I don't don't get to vote on the, uh, on the two sides here. I would have gone with like bounce your eyes or gouge your eyes. You know what I mean? Like, because that's the typical response to bounce your eyes. It's like, well, I mean, Jesus said you should gouge your eye out because if that causes you to sin, throw it away. I think, but that's really where we go with the bounce our eyes side is that I know it's been kind of perverted and used in a different way, but it's like, because we are supposed to, take out the thing that is that is causing the offense which is really our eyes that's where on that side you're going yes good that that's what we're trying to do but what it turns into is we lose that intention and we end up going bounce your eyes because if you're not careful that Jezebel over there that you know the subject that you're looking at is going to be the cause of the temptation and therefore the subject is the bad thing instead of realizing that the subject of whatever your temptation is, is morally neutral. It's the way that you react emotionally, the way you react in your heart that causes the temptation. Because as we've talked before, Jonathan, you and I, we have, we have different temptations, triggers, signature sins, whatever you want to call it. So that way, you know, you could be looking at something and I could be looking at something and I'm like, meh. And you're like, gotta have it. Whereas on the other hand, I could be looking at something and I'm like, gotta have it. And you're like, I don't really care. Think about it from a food perspective. If you're with your friends and you see stuff on the menu, it's like somebody that sees, I mean, I'll just be honest, somebody that sees something that's like this greasy, juicy burger with bacon and mayonnaise and dripping and all of that, you know, food porn stuff, get Jonathan's raising his hand. It's like, that's, oh, I got to have it. For me, uh, no, I don't care. I mean, that 
that's not it for me. That doesn't do it for me food wise. Now, other food things, of course, for sure. So you know that inherently it's not the subject that's the problem or the subject that's causing the temptation. It's you and your own temptation. And that's where we have to bring up the other side of this tension, which is the side that we don't talk about as much. And that is transforming your mind. I've talked about this a lot on here, especially when we talk purity culture that we taught boys to bounce their eyes instead of transform their mind. And that comes from Romans 12. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And my argument is that instead of simply bouncing our eyes, we should put in the hard work to allow the Holy Spirit to transform and renew our mind. And that does not happen naturally. It doesn't happen quickly. It doesn't happen easily. And that's why when we're talking about how we were taught growing up, we were taught the easy route of bounce your eyes, which at a young age, when you're still developing your emotions and your intellect and your discipline and all those things, it makes sense to start there, but we never graduated to the transform your eye or transform your mind piece of this. Transforming your mind means you no longer look at the opposite gender first as a sexual being. The woman at the pool isn't a temptation to you just by sitting there in a bathing suit. Instead, because your mind has been renewed by the Holy Spirit, you see her as how she was created, as just a fellow human being made in the image of God. You see her as John's husband, or you see her as Susie's mom, or you see her as your wife's friend. It's not she is a Jezebel on the pool chair waiting for you or wanting to tempt you, and that's why she's sitting there. You or renew your mind. Go ahead. The, the other aspect is she's also not a collection of different body parts that are there for your taking or your pleasure. That like, that's the other piece is whatever she's wearing. She's not that, that does not mean that the things that are being shown more or less or whatever are somehow potentially there and existing for you. It's very, it's very you centric. It's very property centric. It's very male centric. And in fact, I appreciate that you talked about, you know, she's Susie's mom or she's your wife's friend. Cause typically in the church, we end up relating that, uh, we, we have to justify that women have personhood and value based on their relationship to men or based on their assumed property value to men. Right. You say, and that's why I started off by saying she's, she's made in the image of God. Exactly. That's where it starts. It has to start with that before the quote unquote property type of descriptors. Yeah, because the typical conversation goes, well, Jonathan, I mean, she's someone's sister. How would you feel if that was your mom, if that was your sister, if that was your property, right? It's like, ah, as men, we're so stupid because it's like, oh, if she has a boyfriend, I'm stepping back because she's someone else's, right? Instead of thinking like, wait, she has her own bodily and personhood autonomy and she is someone created. She is also made image. in the image of God. Oh, oh right. whoa, th- that's not enough apparently to a lot yeah, of us. Yeah, exactly. It's gotta be, oh, she's she is uh, claimed by someone else. Or if you were to offend her, you would actually be offending the uh, the male equivalent for her, her brother, her dad, her boyfriend, her husband, whatever. And that, I mean, like that is something I will soapbox on forever on how garbage that is in modern Christian, you know, well, modern American Christian culture. And none of these things, even with the holes and the, the bad things that the quote unquote, Oh, holes probably phrasing my bad. (laughs) If you're not watching on YouTube, you just, you you didn't see Eric's face. As I said that I wanted to know where you were going with that. Cause I thought, (laughs) yeah. Okay. Even with the flaws in the property type descriptors, even in those, if we allow our minds to be transformed, the opposite sex is not a sexual temptation at first glance. And we see them solely as a human being. I think I've shared this before, Eric. I don't know if I shared it on here. Me and you have just talked about this, but because I have done this, and I'm not trying to put myself on a pedestal. It's, it took a lot of hard work to get here. And that's why I, I, this is a soapbox for me. 
but because I see women first and foremost as just another human being, and as we've talked before, like butt cheeks are just the the muscle around the way that the body releases its waste. Like uh, at, at its well, core, let's, that's let's what they are. All butt cheeks are. The reason why we have butt cheeks is because we stand up right. If you look at apes, if you look at any other apes or anything else that walk on all fours, they don't have butt cheeks. Why? Because they don't need the muscles to get them to stand upright. So if you're like, oh man, are you a, you know, a T or an A kind of guy? It's like, well, um, <laughs> I was wondering how you're going to say that. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, physiologically, I think the A is really good because that helps us stand upright and walk in a bipedal <laughs> manner. Uh, the T are pretty good because that's what helps nourish, uh, you know, infants through, I don't know, however old you are when you stop M and the Doing T's. <laughs> this is the dumbest episode we've done in a long time with some of the stuff we're saying here. Are we? Yeah. All to keep from an explicit label warning. Okay, great. Yeah. But because I've, I've transformed my mind in this way, when my wife and I are at the pool or the beach, we play a game where we count the butt cheeks we see. It's just a silly thing that we do. It's completely asexual. We're just looking at bathing suits and we're noticing what people are wearing without judgment. And so at least it's like, hey, does that count? <laughs> like, do, do those cheeks count? Or like, no, those don't count. That's not enough. That's just like, she's just walking. She got a wedgie. That wasn't on purpose. And it's just this fun thing that we do. And it actually keeps me from sexualizing the opposite sex in those games because I'm just seeing her as a human being who is wearing clothes that she is comfortable in on the beach. She mm. is not a temptation at first glance. Yeah, exactly. So we've mentioned the two sides of this tension. We've mentioned bounce your eyes versus transform your mind. And I wish you, I could say that this is a step-by-step -step process. It's, it's you go from bouncing your eyes to transforming your mind but there's actually a tension we have to live in because we still have a sin nature that we struggle with. Well, either we way, it makes it seem like that. Like it seems like it's the easy button. I think that's where, that's where I'm, I'm at with why these are extremes and why there's a tension in the middle because it's like, Oh, bounce your eyes. Hey, if you just don't look at it, it's not going to be a problem. That's not true because then again, you're going to be either running around scared because I mean that's the reaction for some uh, men, especially. It's like, oh, I'm I'm afraid of being anywhere around women because I'm afraid of any sort of temptation or sin or anything else like that. So you're either going to be scared or you're going to start dictating and uh, putting on your values onto other people's bodily autonomy and saying, well, now we need to legislate this or now we need to make sure that you know women can't breastfeed in public or you know whatever else. And now you're playing morality police because we don't want anyone to be tempted. And it's like, those don't work on the bounce your eye side. This, the, the issue doesn't go away. And then on the other side where it's like, well, Hey, just transform your mind. Like let them wear whatever they want to wear and, you know, go ahead and, you know, you're, you should just change your mind, which is like, yes, in a perfect world, that would be great. It, and that's what I think the, the popular probably secular argument is like, um, you know, bodies are not here for your pleasure and, um, you know, women or men or whatever, you should be able to wear whatever you want to wear, free the nipple, whatever, you know, whatever it is. And it's like, yes, Okay, in principle, I agree with you in the same way with like, in principle, it's like, well, you shouldn't be looking like I agree with both of those. However, in practice, um, like you said, you can't just go bounce your eyes, everything's going to go, uh, everything's going to go away as far as any sort of temptation or any sort of sin or any sort of like, you know, anything else that that leads to. Uh, or, hey, you know what? You just need to start looking at them differently and start realizing that they're, they're people and they're people and they, they have their own rights and bodily autonomy. It's like, yes, agree. But that takes a lot of work to get there. So, and it also doesn't take away from the problem either because, you know, you're not, you're, you're not giving someone a way to get from where they are to sure. Whatever you believe your ideal is, there's still flaws on both sides. And I am someone to use a churchy phrase here. I don't believe in complete sanctification where we no longer struggle with anything ever here on earth. And I believe that we have natural desires and natural temptations that will be with us until sin is fully removed from the world and Jesus is back and 
we have our completely transformed new minds, all of that stuff. So if we recognize that, that yes, Eric, like you said, in an ideal world, wear what you want, do what you want. You're not tempted by anything. But if we recognize that on its own, transforming our mind will never be enough because in this world with our current bodies and our current brains and our current makeup, transforming our mind will never be enough on its own. So we will have to continually bounce our eyes. Even if I can initially look at the woman on the beach in a cheeky bathing suit bottom and say, Hey, does that count as cheeks in our game and not think twice about it? If I continue to go back and look at her, over and over and over. And I stare at those cheeks over and over. Not only is it creepy, not only is it completely disrespectful, but I can only fight off my natural desires for so long. Like you're not going to sit an open beer can next to an alcoholic and expect them to never be tempted. Eventually that temptation is going to be there. So as we talk about guardrails on this show, a lot of times, Bouncing your eyes should not be the primary strategy, but it is a guardrail to guard against temptation once you see it setting in. And I think we need to define this too. Like, what is the temptation? Because like we said, not everybody is going to be tempted where it's like, you know, um, uh, I, I don't think anyone who's in a loving monogamous relationship is ever setting out to go like, oh, today I'm going to cheat on my spouse. Right. Like today I'm going to cheat on my partner. I'm going to go out unless there you're a dick. I, I can't. Yeah. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like loving, you know, you're in a loving monogamous relationship where you are valuing each other equally. Like you don't wake up in the morning and go, you know what? Today, today's going to be the day that I'm going to have an affair. And so what does that temptation look like? Um, whether it's because of a physical, uh, you know, y- you might start to think through either that individual person. Cause I think that's what, that's where the, the argument usually starts and stops is like, well, that individual person, is going to be the temptation and you're going to end up wanting to have sex with that person. That may not be it, but you look at enough butt cheeks and now all of a sudden, now you're comparing those butt cheeks with your spouse's butt cheeks. And now all of a sudden that starts to create again, another churchy type of word, like a wedge where <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have said that. Really <laughs> <should have butt cheeks. laughs> That's the bikini a, she was wearing. Yeah, right, yeah. And it's not just the bikini wedge uh, we're talking about. You know, so like it actually creates this wedge where now all of a sudden it's like I'm not as satisfied with the, you know, with my partner or that innocent game. That when I woke up this morning, I was satisfied with, but now right. I'm not because I saw something else. Exactly. Or that innocent game that you're playing now all of a sudden becomes a question in your partner's mind where they go, does he or she not? Like mine, you know what I mean? Though mine don't right. look like that. I don't, and you know, hey, to they clarify, spend more time. Sure, this is a game that we have talked about, and my wife is comfortable with. I am not telling every guy on listening to the show that you yeah. should go play the cheeky game with your wife, hey, honey. And I'm not telling every woman listening to the show that you should be okay playing the cheeky game with no. your husband. No, this is a thing that my wife and I, through hard work in our marriage and an openness and a communication style, we are able to do this. This is a thing for us. This is, it may not be a thing for you. I'm only using that as an example, as someone who in my early twenties, after I got dumped, struggled really hard with pornography. Like I had to do this transformation of my mind in order to get past that addiction. So that is a me thing. I'm not saying it's necessarily something you can do either. Yeah. And I I think that's where we need to be clear on what are some of the other temptations that are involved? Because for many of us, we want to throw away the bounce your eyes thing, or we just assume that's going to keep me from, uh, you know, uh, having a, an affair or, or approaching, you know, and that's the other, (laughs) that's the other arrogant thing is like, oh, I see a woman who's shown a little too much clavicle. I think I'm going to have an affair as if she's going to be like, yes, that's exactly what I want is I want you guys staring at my clavicles, you know, like those sorts of things. It's like, okay. <laughs> you know, even that is like taking hey guys, away. They can see through the sunglasses, what you're looking at. Right. Just yeah. so you know. Yeah. And if you're, if you're looking through pit vipers, those are already a problem. Okay. So they don't, that's not the white Oakley's. That's not what they're going. Yeah. White Oakley's. Oh yeah. The, the gas cans or whatever those are called. 
Anyway, uh, I got some real strong opinions about the country and where we're going. Okay. Anyway, um, back to it. But the the temptation and what it could actually lead to, it could be either an emotional sort of affair. It could be something where, and it may not be with that individual in general. But like I said, for some people, you look at enough, uh, you look at enough body parts. And now all of a sudden, as much work as you're trying to do on making sure that those body parts are attached to someone that has individual value and personhood and they are someone that is created by God, it starts to desensitize you to them being that individual that has been created by God. And now they are individuals created by God that also have these body parts they're showing off, Mm -hmm. right? And then that becomes more and more of a temptation. So I think in the same way as Jonathan says, you know, or I don't know why I went third person on you, but for all of our listeners as an aside, <laughs> the same way as Jonathan says, like they've done work through this is like when you're in that tension between getting to the point where you want to transform your mind, I think you have to figure out what you need to transform your mind from. You need to be honest and name those temptations and name the piece of like, what is it about uh, the member of the opposite sex and what I'm seeing um, that is tempting me? Because for a lot of people, it's like you're gonna you're you're going to hide the real issue because you're like, oh, I, I mean, I'm I would never go do anything with that person that I'm looking at right now, but that doesn't mean that it's not also going to put in your mind something else that could be tempting and unhealthy to either your relationship or future relationships if you're single. And I don't want it to go understood or make an assumption, but Jesus does say that like if you look at someone with lust in your heart it's the same as committing the actual action. So you do have to guard against like, you can only put your hand over fire so many times before you're going to get burnt. And so there is a level of, Hey, you don't need to be going and watching porn for the stories because eventually you're going to see the rest of it and you're going to see something and start thinking some things you shouldn't be. You know what? The cinematography, I'm interested in what lens focal length that they're the using. Lighting the lighting was great in that scene. Yeah. Shadowing. Yeah, exactly. Like, come on. I just want to support those OnlyFans girls, Eric. Oh, geez. They're out there working hard for a living, working hard, trying to, trying to do their best. And so I, I just want to support them. It's, it's not anything sexual bull crap. Like eventually you're going to have those thoughts. So you can't put yourself in the situation over and over. So yes, I think the tension is we have to graduate from bouncing our eyes to transforming our mind while recognizing that transforming our minds will never be complete this side of Jesus coming back and reestablishing the new heaven and the new earth. So it's a both and it is not an either or. It's, it's the old adage of like, you still lock your doors, don't you? Yeah. I mean, like I live in a safe neighborhood, so to speak or whatever. It's like, I'm still locking my doors. Why? Because you want to prevent that nuisance theft. I'm locking my car car doors. Why? Because you want to prevent that nuisance theft that just could happen out, out of the blue somewhere or whatever. It's like, I'm still doing that. You know, those are the types of things where you might have certain types of insurance or you might have certain things that you're like still going to protect yourself here or there. You're going to bring something just in case because the just in case is why you're doing that bit of protection. And so there's that piece of bouncing your eyes, not only protect you, but like you said before, and I think it needs to be said again, is like staring at people and objectifying them is weird and creepy and wrong. And people are also not wearing what they're wearing, inviting you to stare at them. So bounce your eyes anyway, because, and and I don't care, even if you grew up like I did in the nineties, early two thousands and all the shorts said, you know, juicy on the back or (laughs) bootylicious, or there's writing right across, you know, the billboard area in between the nipples. It's like, it does not matter if that's there or not. Like they're not, they're not inviting you to stare and gawk at people, no matter what they're wearing. So we have to transform our mind. So we don't see the opposite gender first and foremost as a sexual temptation, but rather as a human being made in the image of God, our creator. But we have to recognize that our natural tendencies and desires will never go away. And we have to protect ourselves and our relationships from that. Mm Mm-hmm. 
That's it for today. Next week, we're going to be talking about the tension between persecution and coexistence and how the American church has been obsessed with martyrdom in some really, really strange ways. If you ever heard She Said Yes after Columbine or read the Jesus Freaks Martyrs books, this one is for you. If you have any feedback or want to connect with us, Eric is at Eric W712 on all the major platforms. I am at Jonathan underscore Corona on them as well. You can email your ideas or your feedback to us at hello at tensionpodcast.com. If you like the show, do us a favor and rate it and review it wherever you get podcasts. Subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app if you haven't already. Share this episode with a friend if you found it interesting. And as always, thanks for making us a part of your day, and we'll talk to you again next week. Enjoy your summer, guys.